Hello everyone, Rabbi Abe here. Today I'm going to share a secret that is 3,400 years old from the Old Testament, from the Torah, from the Bible that relates to food, and it is the principle of kosher, to which a lot of people say, well, we don't know the reason why, and we just do it because, uh, you know, we follow a particular faith, religion, Judaism, and whatever it is. Um, but what's the reason? And the Kabbalah, of course, like everything else, the Kabbalah answers questions. The wisdom of the Kabbalah is the wisdom that answers the main question that we all have. Why? Why? Why is it done? What is it for? How does it benefit me? Because, you know, the Creator doesn't need me for anything, right? We, the Creator is not, um, a recipient. In fact, the, there is no such concept of receiving within the Creator. We can't give the Creator anything, but rather it is us who need, it is us that need the beneficence of the Creator. And so this whole notion of kosher is really all about us, has nothing to do with God. And I want to read to you from the actual text. What does it say over here? It says, God spoke to Moses and Aaron saying the following. And by the way, this is chapter 11 in Leviticus. Uh, God spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, These are the animals in the world that you may eat, that you may eat. And then it goes through a listing. Among the mammals, you may eat one that has cloven hoofs. Cloven hoofs. What is a cloven, cloven hoof? You know, the hoof is divided into two sections, and that brings up its cud. It chews its cud. That is, it um, regurgitates its food, and it eats, it returns the food, chews it again, and then swallows it. So it immediately rejects the food. Now, ruminant animals do this, like a cow does this, like um, uh, a uh, you know goat, a sheep, um, an ox, uh, what else, uh, deer, uh, you know, some animals do this. Now, there are some animals that do this, a camel does this as well, but it doesn't have a cloven hoof, it doesn't have a, a split hoof. So, that is, what, what this is saying is the animals that we may eat need to have these two features, and we'll get into why, okay? We'll get into why, what does it indicate spiritually, energetically. What is the reason of this food? What is the benefit? We are going to read from Rabbi Isaac Luria's text, for another 500-year-old Kabbalistic text, where he explains how this food can actually protect us from negative forces, negative souls. We'll see how. So, so this is animals, but there's also other types of things, like um, the sea creatures. Uh, so, uh, no shelled, no shelled, uh, you know, things <laughs> like lobster, unfortunately, lobster and shrimp and those types of things are not considered kosher, uh, as far as birds, uh, no birds of prey and no scavengers, other birds are okay. And, um, what else? We said fish. Fish must have Fins, both fins and scales, because some fish have fins. I don't know of any fish that don't have fins. That is fish. Uh, there are other things living in the sea that don't have either, but uh, those are out of the picture. Uh, fins and scales. So any fish that has fins and scales is fine. Um, and as far as what else do we have? Birds, we said. No scavengers, no... Uh, uh, or birds of prey that prey on other animals, right? Not that prey, but prey, right? They go kill and they kill other animals for their food. That's not okay. And um, one more. Uh, oh, yes, there are actually some insects, though that's personally not my thing. Um, there are some insects which are considered kosher. Uh, some people claim they know exactly what they are, others don't. There are certain types of uh, locusts or, uh, you know, double-jointed uh, insects, okay? But 
So there are some insects which are considered kosher, but personally, I'm not into insects, okay? Sorry, I know a lot of people are maybe going in that direction. I personally am not. But, you know, a pig uh, also has a cloven hoof, but he doesn't chew his cud, you know, unfortunately, because I'm sure, you know, all those, these things are very tasty. But again, personally, I'm not eating them. Now, let me explain to you why. Let me explain to you why. First off, kosher has nothing to do with clean. You know, I know pigs roll in the mud. You know, you give him a bath and then he's clean. What's the problem? Oh, spiritually not clean. What does that even mean? Spiritually unclean. What does that actually mean? Clean or not clean? Kosher, not kosher. Well, the superficial spiritual meaning is that certain animals can support our spiritual work and certain animals cannot. Well, of course, then we need to understand what is our spiritual work and what do these animals do? How do they support and how do they not? So let's just take it a little bit. Let's let's take a step back and go back before the time, before the Noah and the flood story. So there's a story in the Bible with Noah he was building an ark, right? A big boat. And he told everybody, look, you know, the rains are going to come. They didn't believe him. Maybe he wasn't convincing enough. I don't know. But the world, it rained. You know, you know the story. 40 days, 40 nights. And he had certain animals with him from both, from clean and unclean animals. Um, and, uh, but before that period of this world being destroyed, whatever that means, we were basically vegetarians. We were in a, we could call it a higher level of consciousness, higher level of consciousness, meaning less desires, less desires, because what is a high level of consciousness, which is very misunderstood. And I I don't want to go off on one of my tangents over here, but, you know, higher level of consciousness basically means closer to the light, closer to the light. It also means less desire. Less desire closer to the light. Yes, correct. In other words, a flower, a plant, the vegetable kingdom, has less desire than the animal kingdom. It has less needs. It does have needs. It needs water, uh, nutrients, and so on. But animals certainly have bigger desires, passive or active, right? They may kill other animals. They need, you know, nourishment. They have, they, you know, they move, they walk, they walk, they run, they do. Actions, you know, a, 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 a plant doesn't really move very far from its place. It may move a bit, but not very far from its place. It doesn't go out and kill other animals. It doesn't, right? It's lower level of activity, which means a lower level of desire. That automatically, without not going into all the details, that automatically gives it a closer connection to the creator light. Why? Because the creator has no desire, has no force of desire. There's no lack within the creator and no desire. Not the way we experience desire. Creator has no needs. Creator is a perfect level of spiritual abundance and light. Needs nothing, requires nothing of us. We certainly require a lot. I mean, if we go to the human kingdom, the human kingdom is certainly the, you know, the most dense, we would say, and has the greatest amount of desire. Certainly more today, and we'll get into a little bit more why, um, but what has even less? What has even less desire than the vegetable kingdom? Well, think about it. The mineral kingdom, in fact, the mineral kingdom is closest to the creator light in a sense because it has almost no des- it has some desire it needs the space that it occupies but besides that it doesn't have a lot going on right it it, it does grow very very slowly but maybe you know it might be deteriorating faster than it's growing i don't know but they know this from satellite photography mountains and so on in whichever way they you know, over years and years and years. This consciousness there, let's leave it like that. Everything in this world has some level of consciousness. There are atoms in there, there's energy, there's consciousness. To whatever degree, 
When we talk about consciousness, we're not talking about a human consciousness, of course. We are talking about whatever it is created as. So a human has its consciousness. Animals have their consciousness at their level. Uh, the vegetable kingdom has its. The mineral kingdom has its consciousness. But of course, it has energy. Listen, rocks certainly have energy. I remember years ago, we used to have pet rocks. Okay, some of you might remember that. Uh, jewelry, a lot of jewelry has rocks, and they certainly have consciousness. After all, rocks are a girl's best friend, aren't they? Oh, that's diamonds, isn't it? Right. So, has consciousness, has energy, or not? Nobody would be interested in them. Nobody would be interested in them, but that's not true. The scarcity, the rarity, or whatever it is that attracts us to precious things, inanimate objects, whatever they might be, art, has consciousness and energy, some things more than others. But human consciousness is the deepest level of the four kingdoms, our human consciousness. And when I say consciousness, I'm talking about the deepest or the greatest level of desire to be revealed. Now that's important. Why? Because desires can be revealed one of two ways, if we're just taking it at its elemental level, the easiest, the simplest level. A desire for our self alone, selfish desire, or desire which is used for the benefit of others, to help others, sharing with others. That doesn't mean neglecting ourselves, certainly not, but it means not only me, but I take others into consideration. Okay, I help, I share, I, you know, I'm useful in the world other than to me only, or my family only. I do also for others. So human, co human consciousness has that um, possibility. So an animal is not in that level because, you know, the animal can't make those types of decisions. Animals make decisions, yes, should I eat or should I sleep? Which one do they do? Well, if I'm more hungry, I'll eat. If I'm more sleepy, I'll sleep. Those are decisions. It's not free will. Animal can't be starving, run to his bowl and say, oh, you know what? I'm getting a little, I'm a little bit overweight. My owner said 10 pounds I need to lose. I'm starving, but now I'm on a diet. No, animals cannot do that. Human being can. He can leave. She can leave. A lower level of desire for the sake of a higher level of desire. That's called free will. Okay? But that, of course, needs, that needs more explanation. And if you don't know what free will is exactly, then go to my destiny course, which you can find on rabbiape.com, and review that. And then you will understand more what free will actually is, because uh, most of the time we're not using our free will. A different idea. Be that as it may, what does this have to do with kosher food? What does it have to do? Well, why is it that before this flood of Noah, we were vegetarians? Why? You know, we were given, Adam and Eve were given every fruit-bearing tree, and so on. And many people, and I'm not here to change your mind by any means, many people uh, have an aversion to eating animal food and so on. The thing, you know, the buzzword or the keyword, I don't know what it is. Plant-based, don't know, okay? I'm not here to say good or bad. I'm here to explain the purpose, the purpose not only of eating, but specifically what is called kosher. Now, kosher only really pertains... 99%, I will say, 99% to animal products or any animal derivatives or anything else which may contain animal products. As an example, you know, most fine cheeses, uh, when I say fine cheeses, I say maybe uh, European uh, origin and things like that, use animal products to create the cheese. It's called rennet, which comes from the lining of the stomach of an animal. Of course, if it's not a kosher cheese, and that is what makes a cheese kosher, 
unless it's, you know, it's clearly written a vegetarian, rennet or whatever, no, no animal product, then the, the dairy, even though some people consider dairy itself an animal product, but I personally love dairy. I don't drink milk, but yes, cheese, I love. And so, um, so without knowing it, uh, we could be eating animal products and not know it because they are used in conjunction with other things. Now, we're not going to go into, uh, you know, things like wine and other, you know, there are other things which also there are uh, a kosher version and a, maybe a not kosher version. We're, we're only right now, we're with the animals, okay? We're with the animals because this is such a, a, a topic of confusion for so many people. What is it really about? Let's just go for a second into what our spiritual work is, basically. What is our spiritual work? You know, in the Bible, in the Bible, it mentions a concept that the Israelites, and we've, 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 we've mentioned what an Israelite is. And it's not specifically talking about Jewish people, Jew, because Jew, as we've said on other occasions, relates to one of the 12 tribes of Egypt. In case you didn't know and never thought about it before, there was the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah were fighters, okay? They were fighting for, you know, well, we won't go into what they're fighting for, but fighting, let's call it for spirituality, okay? But they are known as the fighters against what we'll call negativity. But there are another 11 tribes. Now, the tribe of Judah, in Hebrew, Yehuda, is Yehudim, relates to Yehudim, what we call Jews. But it's a misnomer today. According to the Kabbalists, we know there are people who are Jewish on a soul level and do not know that they are, meaning they come from a specific vibration of soul and through the reincarnation process, which we're not going into, of course, in this video, there will come perhaps a Jewish soul in a not a Jewish body. And that's a particular uh, karmic correction and perhaps vice versa. There are individuals who come also, as we will learn right now, shortly, in the body of an animal, body of an animal, as a specific kind of correction. So we'll get to that in a minute, okay? What does it mean? Incarnation in an animal? Yes. Incarnation in an animal. Yes, it's also possible incarnation in the vegetable kingdom as well. Incarnation in a mineral kingdom. I mean, I don't think we want to go there because that's not, that's not a positive, um, uh, you know, incarnation. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great, it's a prison for the consciousness of the soul that might be in a, a rock, let's say. But that's reserved for extremely negative uh, consciousness of people who created a lot of heavy-duty negativity in the world, in the past. But let's take this a step at a time. What is spiritual work? Considered what? Well, I give you in a nutshell, okay? In a nutshell. I have a desire. It's only for myself, okay? It's a selfish desire, only for myself. I stop. Before I fulfill that desire, I push away the fulfillment of a negative desire, of a selfish desire, and I re-evaluate it, and I see how can I transform this into, into, excuse me, into something positive. So let's say I'm getting angry. Okay, I'm getting angry. Then you should take the workshop that's coming up in a few days. If you're getting angry, all about you workshop. Yes coming up very soon. And go to rabbiabe.com if you want to know more. That's my plug for the workshop. And I, I stop and I say, no, I'm not going to take the pleasure. I'm not going to gratify myself with my anger right now. I have to break it down. Why am I getting it? What is it that I'm getting that I uh, don't want? Because we get angry because we're not getting something we want. Or we're getting something we don't want. I mean, why else do we get angry? Why does a baby cry? Because, right? I, 
this is, you're doing this, you're saying this, I don't like it. I'm getting something I don't want right now. Or I, I, I'm not getting what I do want. I'm upset, right? So somehow we figure out the anger will fulfill us. Of course it's not. It's just a reaction to the stimuli. Someone's pushing a button. Someone's pulling the trigger. So what I do is I take that, I push away the fulfillment of the gratification in that moment. Understood it's not truly gratifying, but I am getting something from it. Am I not? Getting some kind of gratification. I'm getting some kind of fulfillment in that moment. It's not long term, but I'm not. We would never get angry if there was nothing to be gained. Maybe I want to justify. Maybe I want to be right. Makes no difference. I'm pushing it away. And then... I redo it. I say, oh, wait a second. How can I make this work? How can I help this? How can I make it work for both of us? How can I, you know, give this person maybe a piece of my mind, but do it in a different way, frame it differently, whatever it is. What have I done? I have done what the Kabbalists call a three column system. I have activated a three column system system. I have used my desire, which initially uh, starts off me, for me, getting angry, upset. I've said, hold on, I'm going to use this part of my desire to push away, push away the thing that I want right now, instant gratification. I'm going to push that away. And then I'm going to use my desire to bring in or to transform that part of me which is wanted for myself, but I'm going to think of others in conjunction also with me. How do I reframe it? How do I say it better? How do I help the person with this energy? In that way, I have just undergone a three-column system. Now, I know, I don't know if it's not that clear, but, you know, you want it to be more clear. Every situation, the whole general principle, you need to start studying some Kabbalah with me, okay? Or, you know, somewhere, the real Kabbalah. I have a lot of people, you know, coming with all kinds of books and this, and you have to be very, very careful with all the stuff that's out there, okay? A lot of it is really <laughs> not so kosher, okay, to use the phrase. But, nevertheless, we have activated what the Bible calls sgula. Some of you may have heard that term because the Bible, three different occasions, it says that the Israelites are supposed to be a nation of sgula, am sgula, a nation of sgula. What the heck is sgula? Can you tell me? I know some of you Hebrew speakers out there. Can you please define for me? Or if you observe Torah, if you're Jewish, makes no difference if you are or you're not. But if you're familiar with the word, please tell me, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you how the Bible, how the English translations translated, because there's no great translation in Hebrew. A treasured nation, a special nation, chosen people. Really? Chosen for what exactly? We're chosen for what? Doesn't say. Not over there. It does say there. Not other places. Or Lagoyim. These Israelites are supposed to be a light for the nations. A light for the nations. Uh, I'll leave that for some of you to figure that out. But what is this skula business? Well, let's break it down for a minute. The word segula, which has no great English translation, a segula in Hebrew um, is sometimes used for an amulet, you know, something that brings, I don't know, good fortune, good luck. Uh, something ancient Kabbalists used to do is write something called amulets, kamea, right? Write on parchment. We don't do that today, according to the Ari, Rabbi Isaac Luria. That's not something that we should be doing today, okay? Uh, I take the advice. I, I take that advice. Even though everyone's looking for magic, magic show, magic tricks, miracles, instantaneous gratification. No, that's actually taking the longer route. It, you know, without un understanding that. Because you can't take a shortcut without adding on to the bill. If there's something we need to do, it needs to be done. If there's a karma, if there's a tikkun, a correction to be worked out, it must be, we must go through it. There's no short, if there is a shortcut, this is the shortcut. If you ask me, in my opinion, knowing how to use the system is the shortcut. Besides that, there's no shortcut, okay? It's not magic. 
It's not having an experience. I mean, yeah, the light of the creator, that's the experience. That's the ultimate experience, if you ask me. Things that just, ha you know, work out and mesh together, that's the experience. That should be all the time for us. That, things working out all the time, that should be the experience. Understanding why things are happening in our life, that's the experience, not magic. Okay, so sgula, what does it mean? It's from the root word in Hebrew, segol, segol. Now, in Hebrew, segol means two things that are noteworthy. It's the color purple, which if, if you really understand the deeper understanding of this, that would make sense too. But we're not going to get into the color purple right now. It would be a little bit too sublime. But it is a vowel in Hebrew, which is a vowel that contains three dots. Three dots. The vowel which contains three dots. Why is that significant? Oh, I'll tell you why it's significant. Because the secret here is, in order to be a nation of three dots, meaning what? Three column system that the Kabbalah explains. The right, which is the force of sharing of the Creator's light that wants to give us all the time. The left, which is the desire that we have to receive it. And the factor of resistance, which assists us in our spiritual task of pushing away instant gratification. Pushing it away in order to transform. Well, yeah. So when the Bible, the Torah says, you know, Israelites, you have a big desire. I want you, I mean, if you're going to be happy, if you want to be healthy, you need to practice this spirituality, which says, be like three dots, use a three-column system. You need to transform your desire for yourself into a desire, yes, that you will receive from, but use it in order to share with others, not as an end, a means to an end, only for yourself. Therefore, there are precepts of charity, tithing, you know, require, I mean, you don't have to do anything, right? Can anybody command us? No, we, we talked about that in the last video. Nobody can command us, not God, not nobody. You do what you want. But when you understand it spiritually, you might want to, because if you want to connect, if you want to remove that negativity and protect yourself in your life, you may want to learn how to share so that you can connect. If you have a real desire to connect, then you learn how to share, even if you don't want to. You think I want to share? I'm such a sharing guy? No, I'm not. But, you know, like I learned from my teacher, my teacher used to say the most selfish one in the classroom here is me. He's him speaking about himself. But I know how to be selfish because I know if I want what I want, I must share with others. And therefore, he was the most sharing individual. But sharing is not the things that we want to share. Sharing is what's needed by others, not what we feel like sharing or it's comfortable for me to share. Listen, I want to share this. I want to share a necktie with you. Yeah, but I'm starving. I haven't eaten in three days. Yeah, it's okay. But, you know, I have a necktie that I want to give you. So enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous, right? What does this have to do with the food? Ah, what are the three signs of the kosher food? Three signs of kosher food. A split hoof, split hoof, which means it has how many parts? Two parts, a left and a right. And it chews its cud. What does that mean? It receives immediately the food, and immediately, what is it that it pushes it back? It pushes back the thing that it takes on, pushes it back, it resists it. The same way we are supposed to resist the immediate gratification, it resists the food, it pushes it back. These animals are animals which can potentially support circuitry that we want to achieve in our life. The energy, the strength that we need if we're going to eat meat, because eat meat supports desire. We're not looking to reduce the desire. 
okay? A Kabbalist is not looking to reduce his desire. It's, so it's the opposite of some spiritual teachings, which may work for others. But for a true Kabbalist, he's looking to increase his desire. Well, the only problem with that is he needs to be extremely careful that his desire is not a selfish one. It's not only for himself, which it could go, because desire is a double-edged sword. Desire can be used or for yourself alone, or to just, you know, for your own self grandizure or, you know, for you only and your family and your, yeah, right? But that's you. It's still you. It's about you, your ego. You know, I, I want to receive. I want to receive more. Why? Because I want to be able to share more. If I have more, I can give more. That's the consciousness we should all be in. Uh, that's why I say, you know, uh, uh, by the way, if you want to support the channel, please feel free to support the platform, the Rabbi A platform. Why? So I can help, you know, you, you can help me share more. Help me share more. If this is valuable, I think it's valuable. You may or you may not. But if you're watching this, you feel this value. You feel this value. Share. Why? Because you become an extension to bring light to other people. Bring more consciousness. To others. It's the most powerful thing we can do. Think about it. So, what are these foods for? Well, if you increase your desire, you also have to increase the support that you have to be able to transform that desire into one of giving, to one of sharing, to one of benefiting others. Not only us, not only us. That's one of the reasons. So, these foods, these animals, have the capability. They have some built-in circuitry, okay? They have a built-in circuitry within their DNA, which is why they do that. I mean, think about it. Why does the animal have to have a cloven hoof? Why does it have to, you know, have whatever, two stomachs or how whatever the biological setup is for the animal that he swallows the food, he regurgitates it, he chews it again, and then he swallows it again? I mean, why? I mean, can't you just be simple? Well, there's a reason, right? Cosmic reason for everything. Beyond that, there's also the preparation of the food, which I don't want to go too much into detail of, but there is this idea of blood, which I do want to mention, because uh, also the verse in the Bible says, Dam hu hanefesh. Blood is the nefesh. Now, nefesh is... Uh, you know, in English, it doesn't work because there's only one word for soul, pretty much. But in Hebrew, you know, in Kabbalah, is explaining there are five levels of soul. There's something called nefesh, the crude spirit, ruach, higher level of spirit, neshama, a soul, chaya, a living soul, living soul, and yechida, a unified, something which is a unification of the soul with the divine. So uh, we're dealing primarily with the first three, nefesh, the lowest level, ruach, and neshama. Now, we're not going to go into all the souls. We did that again in the Chasing, Changing Destiny course workshop. Again, if you want that, go to rabbiabe.com. It's there. It's available. The nefesh is the lowest. And when we say it's the lowest level, what it means, literally, is it's associated with the most basic desires of that entity. In this case, we're talking about an animal. So the nefesh of the animal is the lowest level of spirit, of energy, of the animal. Let's think about that for a second. It's blood. Blood is a connection to the, to the body, the highest level of the blood, is the white cells of the blood, and the lowest level of the soul is the nefesh. And so there's a there's the linking system over there to the blood, to the blood. So when the nefesh is connected to the blood, I mean, think about it. You, we've all heard of uh, transplant cases or stories where a person got an organ. Usually it's a heart because the heart is the seat of the blood. It's the most concentrated area of blood. And blood has a consciousness of the individual. So... Um, you know, person may have received the heart transplant from a, you know, a, 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 a you know, very uh, strong baseball fan. I mean, I know particularly of a story like that. And the recipient 
had no interest in baseball, but after the transplant, all of a sudden, <laughs> they began to take a liking to baseball and drink beer and eat hot dogs. Because, you know, that's who the, the donor heart was from. Someone who really had a consciousness of baseball. So we've all heard of stories like this. The recipient of an organ taking on maybe some characteristics, sometimes temporarily, sometimes permanently. It depends on the strength of the spirit of the individual anyway. But is there a reason? Of course, there's always a reason. There's always a reason for these things happening. Not by chance. Everything is energy. And so the point here is the nefesh has the lowest level of spirit. Survival, the sex drive, the, you know, the uh, whatever it is, killer instinct, whatever it is, it's the lowest level. I mean, think about it. Do you really want to ingest consciousness of the sex drive of a cow? you know, or whatever the animal is. I don't know. I don't. I, you probably don't either. You don't know how it will affect you. Beyond that, negative souls can have been incarnated also within the animal. That's right. Which brings us back to this idea. When did we change over from eating, you know, nuts and berries from the time of Adam was after the Noah and the flood we were given the rules of eating meat. We were given, we weren't given the rules of eating yet, but we were given meat. Meat. Why? Because according to what the Zohar says, 2,000 years old, and of course all the Kabbalists explain, and I'm going to read to you now from the writings of Rabbi Isaac Luria something amazing, that the souls, all the negative souls that were kind of destroyed in the flood was because of the negativity, negative consciousness of people. They were incarnated, guess where? Into the souls of the animals to be eaten, later eaten, and elevated. So, of course, the manner of, the manner of killing these animals is called shechita. It's, it's a kosher, it's a very specific kind of slaughter. Um, uh, yeah, so different teachings recommend different types of slaughter. According to the Kabbalistic understanding of the kosher slaughter, it's the most painless, and I, I, I'm not here to convince you, okay? I'm just telling you what it says. It is the most painless method of killing the animal. Is this, whatever it is, the process is, I'm not here to vouch for the slaughterhouses or if they're doing what they should be doing, if they're not. But the ideal, the ideal scenario is the animal is treated extremely humanely. And, you know, it is, it, when it's done in this way, it is a pain. It's, it says that a wind, it feel, the animal feels a wind has come and laid it to rest. Simply just goes unconscious. It's an extremely sharp knife. You know, a sharp knife you don't feel. You may not even know that you got cut. And it, you know, whatever. I won't go through the process, but okay, that's what it says. Another reason, let me read to you from the RE. So if we understand that souls, which might be negative, are there. Again, you don't want to eat that meat. I, I, I don't want to eat that meat. Why? Because I don't want to take on a soul of someone who was incarnated in, you know, in a cow or a sheep or a lamb. Uh, he's not positive. How's it going to affect me? Energy effect. You are what you eat. Literally. We just don't understand it. You know, will it support me or will it bring me down? Because meat can bring us down, right? And I can understand a lot of people may not want to eat meat for this reason because they feel it brings them down. Yes. But what the Zohar says is, yes, it can bring us down, but it can also elevate us. Why? Because it can help our desire and support us to transform it. Because we must have desire in order to transform. We're not here to be rocks. Rock has a higher level of consciousness. Vegetable kingdom has a higher level of consciousness. True. Are we here to be that? No. We're here to be human beings and receive more in life. To receive more in life 
according to the Kabbalah, we need more desire. Do you know the reason why most people fail in life? It's because they don't have enough desire. Not enough desire. Not too much. Not enough. Because you need desire to overcome yourself, right? You need desire to have discipline. You need desire to desire for success, to succeed in what you do, to you know overcome your discomfort. Yeah, I don't feel like doing that today. I'm tired. I'll just go rest. You know, I should take the time. No, yeah, I mean, is that going to help you be more successful? But if you don't have enough desire to push you over the edge, well. There you go. So we need desire to help us. I want to read to you. He says, and here he's talking about the uh, principle of the slaughter itself, mitzvata shechita. It's considered a precept or positive to do the slaughter in the specific way called shechita. Again, the kosher slaughter. Why? It's to help us, help the animal, help us. Shama Morizal, my teacher, this is Rabbi Chaim Vital saying about his teacher, the Ari, He says, we already know, you know, in another section, he says, you already know all the meditations of eating. Now, and that's a, maybe a course that we need to give, you know, a course on eating, you know, how to eat, what to eat, when to eat, how much, right? Because if we don't have these things right, you can eat all the best food in the world and still have, you know, issues. 99.9% of health issues, physical health issues, food, food related. Again, even something else going on in the body, you know, food is, can be medicine or can be poison. All right. Anyway, medita- the meditations of eating, you've already learned, he says, Okay, so he says, we've already learned how all the things within the creation, the purpose eventually is that they should return to their original substance at the time of creation. And he says, and he says, it happens very often that the souls of human beings will be incarnated in these animals, in the beasts, meaning uh, cows and goats and sheep, and uh, these are behemoth, it's called. These livestock, livestock. And if the and if the slaughter is with the right consciousness, with the right meditation, if it's a proper slaughter, listen, it's unbelievable what he says. He says, It will cause, if the slaughter is done properly with the right consciousness, It will enable the soul, which is incarnated in that animal, to elevate out of his circumstance, out of where he is. It will enable him to elevate out of the animal. And then he can come back in the body of a human being, the way he originally was. In order that he should be able to complete his uh, karmic correction in the body of a human being, as he was supposed to do before he created the negativity. And the secret, the secret, one of them anyway, of this shchita, of this slaughter, is to sweeten. It's to sweeten all the judgments. So, what does that mean? That also means, it means many things, but it means that if there is a negative soul there, if there's a negative soul within that animal, it will sweeten the the dinim. It will, first off, release that soul. It will release it, 
that it won't be able to affect us. The negativity of that spirit will not be able to affect us and it will sweeten any uh, lingering negativity. It's called sweetening the judgment. Will not affect us in a negative way. So, this is an unbelievable thing. I mean, some of you, I know many people vegetarian and animal lovers, and I, that's great. I'm an animal lover as well. But I, I, like, I like meat. And there's a reason for that, by the way. If you like meat and you're depriving yourself of it, well, that you need to ask a question over there because if you have if you don't have desire for it, it's one thing. Then you shouldn't eat it if you have you know no desire. But if you have desire for the meat and you're not eating it and you are depriving yourself, you feel deprived. That's not necessarily a good thing, physically or spiritually, because it can be a sign that there is light, there's sparks, there's energy there that is there for you that you are responsible to elevate. Now, that's a longer discussion, okay? But uh, but there, there is a concept like that, right? The elevation of sparks of light that only we can elevate back. Spiritual responsibility. Whether we understand it at this point or not, this is a little bit. This is the meaning of kosher. Kosher. So it has many facets. But it's not about a clean piece of meat or an ancient ritual that doesn't have an effect today. No. It's the again, two aspects. The type of the type of animal and the, also the way it's prepared, uh, meaning, you know, the separation of the lowest level. That's through the preparation. It's called soaking and salting. Again, those are details not as important as understanding number 1, the concept there's no shortage of places to buy kosher meat, okay, if that's something you're interested in. <coughs> Excuse me, but first we really need to understand it. And I hope through this video we have a little bit more understanding uh, about how it is capable. Again, for the one who desires, for the one who has consciousness. Because the one who doesn't have any spiritual consciousness, it's not going to help. I, 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 I would say that. I don't think it's going to help. First, you have to have a consciousness that you have a desire to work spiritually. You have a desire to transform. Then you can use a support system. If you use a support system and you don't know what it's for, well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that it helps in that sense, right? But when you do, and when you have a desire, and when you really are working on it, this can certainly and absolutely does help support the consciousness of an individual who truly desires to transform the things in their life, transform their consciousness from one of you know selfish receiving to one of receiving for the sake of others, which helps to connect us with the Creator's light, which is all the beneficence that you know this, this world has to offer is only coming from one place, and that is the light of the Creator. Be blessed, everyone. Please remember, sign up for the workshop. It's coming up this Sunday. Go to RabbiAbe.com, and I'll see you over there. Blessings, and hope to talk to you soon.